another Florida Friendly Landscaping um, meeting and class. I have today with me my regular co-host, as he likes to call me on Thursdays in the virtual plant clinic, um, Dr. Bill Lester. Welcome, Bill. Good morning. How are you? I'm just great. I brought you here because we're talking about bugs and you are, you're, the, you're, you're literally a plant doctor. You have a doctor of plant medicine, which is why we're utilizing you today, but you, you're minored in entomology, correct? Or you learned a whole lot about it. <laughs> I took a lot of graduate level entomology classes. So yes, I've worked with insects quite a bit and I get questions at the office almost daily about them in one form or another. And the reason a, a person with a doctorate in, in plant medicine, a DPM is what you have, um, know so much about insects is because they are very, very often um, vectors of disease. So it all kind of works together. But today we're gonna take a different look at it. <clears throat> I kind of went with a, you know, starting out with the positive favorite plants. Ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> and then a Florida pest insects. So we're kind of looking at it in a different way. What are the, um, what are the characteristics? What are the type of plants that, um, you can go ahead and let them in. Bill, we'll, we'll just keep an eye. Um, okay. Um, what are the characteristics of, uh, you know, the certain plants that certain pest instinct insects look for. And I think there's gonna be a pattern here. So I'm asking you to keep your, your eyes open, your senses kind of peeled as to what characteristic you may notice about these plants that are favorites of a lot of the pest insects here in Florida. For those of you who have watched a lot of our classes, I do think you'll, you'll pick up on that pretty quickly. Here are our email addresses. I have no idea why the font did that. So <laughs> I'm at Lily B at Hernando County.us here, um, L I L L Y B. And Dr. Lester is W Lester at ufl.edu. If you would like a PDF copy of this particular program, then um, please go ahead and email me. You can email Bill, he'll just send it to me, and, and I will send you a PDF copy of this. Or if you have any follow-up questions, anything like that, um, feel free to email us. That's really the best way to reach either one of us is via this, e these emails. I show you every week the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping. It's amazing how you can take nine principles and make a career out of them. <laughs> But there are just so many things to talk about. And today, the principle we're going to be covering quite a bit is this number six, manage yard pests responsibly. I realized that Dr. Lester and I have not been talking much about insects lately. We're talking a lot about pollinators, that's true. But as far as the insects that can pose a problem in our gardens, we haven't really covered them a lot in the past several months. So we decided it was time to get back into the talking about insects. And speaking of which, in the world, you know, there are over a million, not a million, there's not over a million insects. There's a, over a million species of insects. They far outnumber us. So, you know, for those of you who are queasy, you know, about insects. And believe me, some of these pictures, when I was working on this, I was freaking myself out because some of these are pretty up close pictures and they're kind of, you know, gross. But we wouldn't survive without insects. That's, that's the, you know, whole, that's the plain truth of it. And, you know, we just got to accept, of course, there's, there's a whole bunch. And in Florida, you know, you, we hear from our non-Floridian uh, relatives and stuff. Oh, you, Florida and bugs. Well, there are over 13,000 known species, not 13,000 bugs. That would be nice if there were only 13,000 <laughs> insects. Um, 
not really. We need a lot more than that. Um, 13,000 species known so far, um, but more and more are coming in because you know we have international trade. Um, we are a very mobile society. You know, a thousand years ago, uh, pest insects, pest plants, or different plants or whatever would come in very slowly, like on the fur of animals and, and, and on the occasional Spanish ship that came through. Now we have just, you know, um, cargo ships, we have um, plane travel, we have our own selves traveling back and forth across the country, you know, just inadvertently moving stuff around. So, so you know, just things change all the time and we have more and more species brought in. But the good news of that is of all those, millions and millions of insects that I was talking about, less than 1% of the species are considered pests. So I have 100 bugs here, I counted them. <laughs> when, when I first started and I sent Bill the uh, draft of this, I had 10 or I had nine bugs and then this pest guy over here. And I literally woke up over the weekend and thought, that's 10%, that's not 1%. So I added more bugs when I got back in on Monday. Um, less than 1% are considered to be pests. Unfortunately though, the pest is not gonna stand out. He's not gonna hold a sign like he is in this picture, nor is he going to be way bigger and scarier looking than the other insects. That's kind of the issue. They can blend in very easily. And the danger with that is, at least what I consider to the danger with that is you may just decide, well, get rid of them all then. And that is not what we wanna do at all. All these other 99% are beneficial, or they used to say, or really aren't doing much of anything, but you know what they are doing? They're a food source for some other critters out there. So, you know, they're very, very important, the other 99%. And so, ID, ID is very much the key. Don't just, you know, the, the old adage, the only good insect is a dead insect is absolutely not true. We need to target the pests and let everybody else be there because they're helping keep the balance of nature and they're our allies and they are helping us in this battle. So, we let someone else in. Um, we're going to start with first, we will look at the plants. Then we'll move on to the pest that affects these plants. And then we'll move on to doctor's orders. And that's what Dr. Lester will be here helping us with. So these particular plants here, great myrtles. You might want to take notes and see how many of these plants show up more than <laughs> once. Uh, camellias, gardenias, roses. So the pests we're going to talk about can be a problem on all these plants. Podocarpus, milkweed, and citrus. So remember I told you to keep an eye out for a pattern here. I'll give you a hint as we're looking for this pattern, how many of these plants on this list are native? The milkweed could be <laughs> that, the, you know, but um, that's about it. So, keep, you know, just keep watching that pattern there. What is the, the pest that's gonna show up on all these? Well, actually these guys could show up just about anywhere. Aphids, they're our most common pest. And um, they are absolutely everywhere. There are several, probably many different kinds of species. They don't, they do have to mate with each other, but they give birth to live young. Now, what they do is you'll notice this is the underside of a leaf. So what they are trying to do, that's where you're gonna have to find them by turning a leaf over because that's the more tender side of the leaf. And you know, they're not out there thinking, I wanna ruin this human's life. 
There's no way they're even thinking about you at all. They're no different than you going out to lunch somewhere or to dinner somewhere or doing whatever you have to do to survive. So they've got piercing sucking mouth parts. And what they do is go to the underside of the leaf and they poke in there and they suck out all the nice juices out of the leaf. And you know, what do leaves need to produce? They need to photosynthesize. So they make carbohydrates. So these insects are sucking out the sugary carbohydrates out of the leaf. That's what happens first. But they have a secondary um, critter that kind of farms them. They're like little mini uh, carbohydrate sugary substance producers for ants. Somewhere along the way in um, evolution, ants figured out, hmm, they'll suck it out of the plant and then they will excrete it. And what they excrete is very sugary because that's what they're getting out of the leaf. And the ants like that and the ants get their energy and carbohydrates from you know, uh, aphid and other type of uh, critters too, other type of insects from their excrement. <laughs> So whether they, you know, really know, no, no, or it's just instinctual, they, they start to farm that. It's called honeydew, their excrement. And ants want it. So they actually will defend these aphids against other predators. And what happens is this excrement that comes out of the aphids drips onto the other leaves on the plant on the tops. And it's interesting because um, there's a person I knew in high school who now lives in Los Angeles. And I was watching him on Facebook and he was commenting on these oak trees, urban trees, that he was just learning about aphids and how the ants will take care of them and farm them because what he noticed was a lot of ants. <laughs> that was what he noticed first. And so he was reading up on it and realized that the ants will take care of these aphids. But what he thought was the black stuff that grows on the honeydew, which is called sooty mold, he thought that it was smog because he lived in Los Angeles. So I had to explain to him, well, you got you know, two thirds of the way there, but the sooty mold will happen anywhere. Certainly happens here in Florida with our humidity. So that's what, you will probably notice first is these black leaves and you can actually scrape it off, but that's the whole process that is occurring there. I explained that to you in detail because with aphids is not the only insect that that's gonna be happening with. So we know we have these aphids. Now we're gonna to go to the good doctor and find out the doctor's orders. Talk about IPM this first time and then your, your orders. Okay, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And that's the way that you wanna kind of look at controlling any kind of pest, whether it's an insect pest or a disease or weeds, because weeds are a pest in your garden, or it might even apply to squirrels. They use IPM programs in hospitals and schools. You can use it indoors with indoor pests. It's just a way of looking at it where you're gonna figure out, number one, you're gonna identify the pest correctly. You're not just gonna guess or ask on a Facebook group, what does everybody use to get rid of bugs on their plants? You know, bug, bugs tells me nothing. What kind of bugs? Do you even have a bug or is it a disease? Or you're not watering enough or too much or whatever the problem, the real problem might be. So the first step is identifying what your problem is exactly, figuring out how to prevent it, taking different cultural controls, maybe planting the plant in question in a different spot. Maybe it's getting too much sun, too little sun for any kind of annuals or vegetables growing in at the right time of year, uh, growing healthy plants, fertilizing correctly, watering correctly, because healthy plants are gonna be able to go to um, protect themselves much better from insects, diseases, and a number of other things. Biological control is basically 
encouraging the beneficial insects that are already in your yard to set up house in your yard and make babies and eat all the bad pest insects. And aphids are a very, very good example of a pest insect that is eaten by a lot of other insects. If you, if I look at, if you bring a couple of leaves into me and they're covered with aphids and I put them under the microscope, I'll probably see evidence of aphids that were killed by teeny tiny little parasitoid wasps. We're not talking paper wasps that sting you, but ones that are maybe like half the size of a grain of pepper or ladybugs, they eat aphids, uh, green lacewing larva, they eat aphids. Um, there's a number of other insects, um, seerfoot fly larva gobble up aphids. So aphids are eaten by a lot of good insects out there, but the best way to control aphids or keep on top of them is by scouting or checking your plants frequently. And aphids really like the new growth, the new growing tip. That's usually where you're going to find them. They hide underneath the leaves a lot. So go out there and check your plants, turn over the leaves, get yourself a magnifying lens or um, a hand lens so that you can see little teeny tiny insects. These things are small. You're going to need a little help seeing them. And keep on top of what's happening in your garden. When you see aphids, if let's say I saw 20 aphids on a leaf on my hibiscus out in my front yard, but I saw a couple of ladybugs there also eating them, I wouldn't spray because I would figure I got aphids, but I got ladybugs too, and they got them under control, but I'm going to keep checking. If one day I check and all of a sudden I have a thousand aphids and the ladybugs are gone, maybe I need to spray or take some kind of steps. But you always want to assess the situation properly, identify your pest properly before you start thinking about any kind of controls or sprays. If you have aphids on growing tip of a plant, most aphids don't have wings. So if you could, you could take a garden hose and just slightly hose them off or spray them off, blast them off onto the ground or into the grass or something, and they're gone. Problem solved. You could, if they're growing on just one little tip or one branch of your plant, take your clippers and snip it off and throw it away. Problem solved. You don't have to always rush out to the shed and get a jug of spray and spray something. If you do need to spray something, all you need is insecticidal soap, which is salts of potassium fatty acids, I believe, which is very safe for you to use. Of course, you need to read the directions, wear gloves, wear some kind of eye protection when you're mixing it up. You don't want it to splash up into your eyes. Don't drink it. Don't get it all over yourself. Don't breathe it in. But if you follow the directions, it is very safe for you and very safe for pets, children, everything else that might be living in your yard. So aphids, even though they're very, very common on a lot of different plants out there, I think Lily had a good list, but that was not a complete list. Pretty much any plant you have has the potential of having aphids on it at one time or another, one species or another. We have maybe 20 species that are common to Hernando County. So there's a lot of different ones. They're different colors. They're pretty easy for me to identify, but if you figure out it's an aphid, all you need is insecticidal soap to control it. Very easy to control. Okay, next, pa next past or next bunch of plants, I guess. Next bunch of plants. And if you could keep an eye um, on the, the chat and um, the... Sure. Uh, the participants, I already have removed someone who has sent me, you know, kind of a strange chat. So if you're here nefariously, we're going to remove and report you and report you to our county, um, you know, admin IT um, as well. So, you know, <laughs> welcome to everyone. But if you're here for some shenanigans, we're going to remove you. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to the next bunch of plants. Roses, citrus, citrus shows up a lot. Unfortunately, poor citrus has a lot of issues. Uh, plumbago, Indian hawthorn, and dozens, <laughs> dozens more. These are like the most common, but they could show up on dozens and dozens more. Here we have the thrips. 
you can have a million thrips or you can have one thrips, just one of those silly words. <laughs> um, you know, it is, you can have one thrips, that's what it's called. And there, I didn't put um, two different kinds here. Uh, there are chili thrips as well. And chili thrips, they can, they're, they're happy with anything. They are very much opportunists. If you have a plant, they're happy to be, you know, partake in it. Um, for a while there, I know the University of Florida was pretty like um, very concerned about thrips and um, unnaturally like putting out information like they could be everywhere, they could be, you know, the cause of all problems. But I know that Dr. Lester is a bit more um, calm about it. So obviously over time they have figured out, you know, this isn't going to be the end of the world. Um, the spring is their peak season. They do prefer plants in the shade. And what you're gonna get is this mottled leaf kind of look. Sometimes this, um, you know, this, you know, you can tell it's been, you know, the juice is sucked out of it, this seersucker kind of look here. Here's what our friend looks like. And then there's the chili thrips. Um, it's not at all particular just to chili. <laughs> Um, maybe that's what the country where they found them, that could be, um, but now they're, they've moved all over the place. And the problem with them, unlike these guys, which you can see with your eyes and treat, as he told you to, these guys love to get inside of things, especially like rosebuds, things like that. So now doctor, what are our orders? <laughs> for these thrips? Well, thrips are funny because you have um, a big peak in their population early in the spring. A lot of different species will overwinter in oak trees and they emerge in the spring. We even get phone calls. We didn't get any this past spring, but we've gotten them in the past. People with swimming pools. And if you have an oak tree over your swimming pool, they call and they say, I have billions of these teeny tiny little insects in my pool and they turn out to be thrips because the thrips emerge in the spring in huge numbers and the um, immature thrips are up in the oak trees feeding on the leaves they don't damage the oak trees they don't kill oak trees uh, an otherwise healthy oak tree can support bil literally billions of thrips but then they want to drop off to the soil and pupate and come out as adults and what happens is they drop off and go into your pool. So we've seen that situation before. In the spring, it's, if you have that problem, they're gone within about a week or so. It's a very short-term problem. But thrips will come out in the spring. And then when they get on your landscape plants, they feed on the really teeny tiny leaves that are just beginning to emerge in the spring. And they damage them so that when those leaves get larger and emerge, now they're damaged, they're, they have chunks taken out of them, they're twisted, distorted, and you're wondering what's wrong with my plant. Sometimes if you examine the plant at that point, the thrips are already gone. So these are an insect pest that can do damage and then leave before you even know that you had a problem with them. Probably the worst plant that people may have in your yard where you're gonna have a constant thrips problem is knockout roses because the invasive chili thrips love knockout roses and they will damage the leaves and do a lot of damage. But thrips, like I said, the population peaks in the spring. After that, they kind of drop off during the summer. They're a very hit or miss pest. They're a problem in commercial agriculture. They could be a problem with peppers. They're kind of a very, they're not a generalist pest. They're kind of a specific pest. But there is a very, very good control for them now, and it's called spinosad. S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, and you can look that up. You can order that on Amazon, and they'll deliver you a bottle. It's approved for organic production. It's made from a naturally occurring bacteria they found that when you spray this, it kills thrips very, very well, works very well on caterpillars, and works very well on leaf miners. And it's really about the only control for leaf miners. Nothing else works on them except for spinosad. So spinosad, if you have a problem with thrips or leaf miners can be a very valuable tool in your toolbox. Once again, very safe to use, very low toxicity, 
follow the directions, mix it according to the label directions, wear all the protective equipment, but you, it's not a broad spectrum insecticide that's going to be a danger to your pets or the dogs or the kids or neighbors when they're outside. Okay. Now the next set of plants, we'll see what kind of uh, pest insect we have that bothers azaleas, citrus, <laughs> red buds. Red buds um, are native, but they're becoming harder to grow here in central Florida. Holly, roses, viburnum, red cedar. There's a, there's a native, which is you know interesting, and over 200 other plants. <laughs> so we don't have enough room for <laughs> to list all of these. Now you'll see where the native plants do pop up somewhat on this list, um, but the overwhelming majority are non-natives. And usually the natives though, uh, fight off these problems a lot easier than the non-natives. You may not even know they had the, you know, the issue. It just came and went. Here's our friend, the spider mites. <laughs> they could be on any number of things. And these are really pretty common. I'm sure Dr. Lester gets phone calls about, I have these weird webs all over my roses, you know, all over my hollies, things like that. So um, these are mites. So an insecticide is going to do nothing <laughs> to a mite. Um, they're usually orange to orange, red, very, very small. Um, they can be adults in two to four weeks. They'll lay several hundreds of eggs, and usually you'll see them in the summer and the fall. And you will have um, a plant with this weird kind of webbing all over it. And that's why they're called spider mites, but they're not spiders. They're not insects. They are mites. So what does the good doctor have to tell us about the, controlling them? Spider mites are, they look like the picture that you just showed, or sometimes they could be bright red, like brick red, and they're the same species. So within that same species, you have a lot of color variations, and the population does build up during the summer. They like it. They love it, where it's very sunny and very hot. So they're going to be on your full sun plants, the worst. They like it where it's very hot. Some of those plants that you showed, like they could be a problem with azaleas. If you plant an azalea in full sun, it's not the right place to plant an azalea. Azaleas do great underneath oak trees where they get that speckled sun shining through. So if you plant an azalea in the full sun, spider mites will find it and they will have an absolute feast because they love azaleas, but they love full sun and hot conditions also. So people who put their azaleas in the wrong spot have the worst problems with spider mites. Prevention is very important. You need to catch spider mites early. If you catch them when you only have a few spider mites, they're very easy to knock down and control. All you need is insecticidal soap. You're probably gonna have to use it more than once. So it's not spray once and all your problems are solved. You're gonna have to keep checking, check the label. It will tell you when it is safe to reapply. One week, two weeks, however many weeks, just follow the label. If you have them on just one growing tip or one branch, you could just snip that branch off and throw it in the trash and be done with it. There are predatory beneficial mites. They're really difficult for the com for, you know, a homeowner gardener to be able to identify or tell the difference between the two of them. But there are things out there that eat spider mites and naturally help to keep them under control. A lot of avoiding spider mites problems is planting plants in the correct place and also a good plant choice. Some plants are much more prone to spider mite issues than others. And early detection, I've had people bring plants in pots to the office that really showed the webbing on there. You couldn't even see the plant. It was completely covered in webbing. <clears throat> and at that point, you're not gonna be able to fix that plant. Once you have 6 million spider mites on a small um, milkweed or small plant, there's no going back and fixing that. If you had caught it when you had a couple dozen, you could fix that because 
they reproduce amazingly fast. And under ideal conditions, it's summer, it's sunny, it's hot. You have 10, the next day you have 100, the next day you have 1,000. They just skyrocket like that. So if you catch them early, spider mites are not a big issue. But if you ignore your yard and you go out one day and something's covered with webbing, it's going to be a little tough to get under control. Okay. Now the next set of plants. Uh, the, first, the first one's a big clue. <laughs> Oleander. Desert rose. Bougainvillea. Natal plum. A lot of these are South Florida type plants. Rubber vine, mandevilla. So a lot of these we're not even going to be growing up here anyway, but we can grow oleander. And what is one of the rules that we always talk about that is if there is an insect named after your plant, <laughs> you better expect an issue from that insect. <laughs> Here's our oleander caterpillar. Um, you can get 12 to 75 egg masses. Tell them you're busy. Um, <laughs> hatch in two to six days. And they can, they'll defoliate a uh, oleander. I've never seen them kill one, but- No, they, they, can, they always grow back. Right. They can make it look ugly. Yes. So what I tell people is if you want an oleander, have it in the backyard. Don't rely on it to be like a specimen tree in the front yard because <laughs> you're going to have issues with this caterpillar here munching away on it. And then that caterpillar is going to turn into this polka dot wasp moth. Not a wasp, don't worry, won't sting you. It's shaped like a, a wasp is all. And um, I think they're kind of pretty. Somehow or another, they remind me of Minnie Mouse. I really don't know <laughs> why. But um, so this is one of those issues that is more of a cosmetic issue than any kind of real problem. But what do you have to say about that, Dr. Lester? Caterpillars are very easy to control. Caterpillars tend to be um, host specific. So certainly, because I know if somebody tells me I have a problem with the caterpillar, if they if they send me a picture of the caterpillar and I know what plant is feeding on, it's very, very easy to figure out exactly what species of caterpillar it is. Uh, obviously, prevention, uh, trying to avoid the plants that attract them the most. There, if you have an oleander, you will have oleander caterpillars. There is an azalea caterpillar. It's really not all that common, but we see every once in a while um cabbage looper is a very common caterpillar so if you grow cabbage or any closely related plants expect to see those on your plants also for anybody that's ever grown tomatoes you know you're going to get the great big tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm caterpillar feeding on them so if you're growing plants that you know are attracted to specific individual caterpillars then be on the lookout for them you know they're coming you can just pick them off by hand. I'll, I grow tomatoes and I get tomato hornworm caterpillars and I'll pull them off and I'll throw them over the fence in the neighbor's yard. Here we go again. <laughs> Problem solved. Never move next door to Bill. <laughs> sure, they get all the insects out of my yard. You know that wasps, the paper wasps and ones that make nests around your front door and underneath the power meter outside, they all are predators of caterpillars. <clears throat> so wasps are beneficial. They help to balance the population of caterpillars. Some people who grow milkweed deliberately for the monarch butterfly caterpillars get very upset with wasps because they carry off their caterpillars. But uh, anybody who has an oleander should be very happy to see wasps in your neighborhood or yard because they're carrying off those caterpillars. So it all depends on is this a caterpillar I want to keep because it's going to turn into a beautiful butterfly? Or is it one I want to get rid of because it's destroying my plant? You need to make that decision for yourself. And then for a control, don't use seven or anything really strong or broad spectrum. There is a control and it's right here, Bacillus thuringiensis or thuringiensis. 
That is the name of a naturally occurring bacteria that you can purchase uh, in a ready-made spray. It's already mixed up for you in a spray bottle, or you can buy the concentrate to mix yourself. It is a bacteria that you mix up and spray on your plants. When the caterpillar eats a leaf that has that on it, the caterpillar will stop feeding and it will die in one to three days. Works very, very well and will not hurt anything else. So you can spray your plants and a caterpillar can eat it and a lizard or a bird or something else will eat that caterpillar, won't hurt them at all. It's a naturally occurring bacteria in the environment. Doesn't hurt people, but of course we don't recommend drinking BT concentrate out of the bottle. Don't ever do anything like that. Read the directions, wash your hands, wear the correct protect protection equipment, but it's very, very safe to apply. And BT is the number one perfect control for any caterpillar problem. Just remember though, if you want those butterflies, then you don't want to use DT because it works on all caterpillars. Yes, remember beautiful butterflies for your butterfly garden come from caterpillars. Mm -hmm. So be careful which caterpillars you're eliminating. All right. All right, the next set of plants, oak trees, azaleas, avocado, hawthorn, lantana, sugar cane, and sycamore. So the first and the last could be natives. Uh, on none of the, well, there are some native lantana as well. Bill's looking confused there. Let's see what. No, I'm trying to figure out what insect it is. Yeah, see? Well, let's see. And the <laughs> winner is. Oh. Oh, yes. The lace bug. Not to be confused with a lace wing, which is a beneficial insect. Um, lace bugs, if I would have left it at azaleas, you probably would have guessed it. It's that I threw those others in there too that they have been found on. Um, they are very pretty. Look at their lacy wings. But they leave the azaleas looking pretty lacy <laughs> as well. And they feed on, uh, of course, under the leaves. That's where um, almost all of these. Number one, it's the most tender place for those piercing, sucking mouth parts to get what they want. And number two, it's protected protected from the sun, protected from the predators, all of that. So um, they really only lay about five to seven eggs a day, and the adults can live to be about one to four months. And they can cause this mottled looking, um, you know, uh, azalea. And some of the others, they've been known to cause some issues as well. I would think the oak trees and the sycamores, you know, as adults are gonna fight them off pretty well. But let's say we have these on our avocado or our azalea or something like that. What do we do, Dr. Lester? You know, I've only seen them on azaleas. And we do have the avocado lace wing here. Um, if anybody grows avocados, you have an avocado tree. And there's a native oak tree one that if all of you go outside this afternoon and check your oak tree and start turning over leaves, I can almost guarantee you, you'll find some, but they never rise to the point where they actually damage the oak tree. So they're out there, they're native, they feed on the oak tree. If the oak tree is otherwise healthy, it, it does not damage them or injure them. You would never ever have to spray an oak tree for um, lace bugs. The only ones I see that are really damaging are the avocado ones. And on occasion, the um, azalea ones, although we don't see them very often. So like I said, it's only an occasional problem and it's very easy to control. It is a small, soft-bodied insect. So if you do have a problem on azaleas or avocados, insecticidal soap will knock them right out. You're gonna have to get the underside of the leaves because they always live on the bottom of the leaf and spray it well. You may have to follow up and spray again, but that's all you have to do to get them under control. Okay. Now our next one is a pest of citrus. Keeps showing up, doesn't it? Isn't everything. <laughs> Potted plants in general. <laughs> fruits, all kinds of different fruits, different vegetables, herbs. And being, this is very, very uh, generalized here now, isn't it? 
or if you have a greenhouse, pretty much everything in a greenhouse. I think you can guess what this one is, Dr. Lester. I think so. Yeah, here we go. Our icky, yucky looking friends, the mealy bugs. Like I said, I was kind of like giving myself shivers making this particular presentation of all these close-ups here. Um, they'll get on any part of the plant, the stems, the leaves, the buds. They're pretty, you know, they know how to get what they need out of all of it. It's gonna curl the leaves or stunt them. Um, they look like a mess. Mealybugs, I think, are the messiest kind of insect. They just look like a mess, a white cottony mass. I would change it to mess. But they have about 15 generations a year, and a female can lay 600 eggs. Very much a problem in greenhouses and in, in, in those indoor situations. Again, they're going to produce honeydew. So you're going to see this sooty mold, and that's going to attract ants. And there are so many different kinds. There's 275 species in the United States. Um, what we see a lot most common around in Florida would be the pink hibiscus mealybug and the citrus mealybug. It even gets a name for it. So these gross white messes, what do we do about them? <laughs> We only have maybe a dozen species that we would normally see here. Pink hibiscus mealybug is much more widespread and it's going to be more of a problem south of here down in South Florida. Uh, we get long tailed mealybugs. I think that's what you had in the picture. Mm -hmm. And mealybugs are funny because they'll, they'll be in a group on either a stem or the underside of a leaf and they make a lot of cottony looking stuff. So they'll have this cottony substance on on their backs on top of them and they'll make a little cottony mess and if you look real close and watch for a while you'll see them moving around um keeping an eye on your plants is very important it is one of the ones that affects house plants don't get into your house and be a pest on your plants so mealybugs spider mites those are the two main ones on house plants um, if you saw, see only a few, because they do tend to live in groups. So if your only problem on a great big hibiscus is a little bunch of them on the end of one branch, you could just clip that off and throw it away. There are those parasitoid wasps, the wasps that are like half the size of a grain of pepper. And if you look at your mealybugs and you take a magnifying glass or a microscope, I have a microscope, and you look at them closely, and some of them look dead and they have little holes on their back. That means that there was a wasp inside of them that is hatched and the mealybug is dead. And those wasps will keep certain insects under very, very good control. You won't have to spray if you have a lot of those little wasps doing their job there. But if you do have to spray, especially if it's a, a house plant, because problem with house plants is you'll get a few pests, but you'll get almost no beneficials unless you live with all your doors and windows open all day long for everything to come and go, which most of us don't, um, you're probably gonna have to spray. Insecticidal soap will knock them right out very quickly. Very easy to control with insecticidal soap. Okay. Now this one, this one should be easy because uh, <laughs> not, not near the amount, not near the list. Um, although they will taste everything in your yard. <laughs> They're, they prefer bulb plants, amaryllis, daylilies, um, and again, citrus. Poor citrus just really gets picked on, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And this, um, this guy gets blamed for a lot more damage than he does just because he's not attractive. But here he is. I can hear everybody right now. Oh, yeah, ew, yes. <laughs> Our southern lover grasshopper. Um, once he looks like this, any kind of chemical control is out the window. Look at, I mean, you can't, you can't get through that armor. Um, usually when he looks like this, um, when he's a baby, he hangs out with his friends. You'll find them in groups. And then as they get older, they become loners. Um, these guys are easier to control. But the good thing is they really only have one generation a year. And although people get very upset about them, um, I've had them in my yard for years. And 
you know, they don't eat up my entire <laughs> yard. Now, if you're trying very specifically to grow bulbs or amaryllis or something, you might find, you know, that you want to try to control them. So then we turn to Dr. Lester. Lover grasshoppers are very easy to control. Like Lily said, when there are large adults, like they are right now this time of year, they're, they have a very thick cuticle or skin. There is very little that you can spray. You don't want to have to be spraying your entire yard with like seven or a broad spectrum pesticide to try to kill two dozen lover grasshoppers that are kind of scattered all over the place. Probably not going to work very well anyway. What you want to do, keep your eyes open here in Hernando County in the first two weeks of March is when they hatch and they only have one generation a year. So if you go out there and diligently scoop up the little ones, they're going to be black and then they're black with either a yellow or reddish orange stripe and they're all in great big groups, scoop them all up into a bucket of soapy water and get rid of them. If you do that for a couple of years, you'll see the number of lover grasshoppers on your property drop like a rock. It really does lower the population. So controlling them in early March when they first hatch is a great way to have fewer of them. You can always, even when they're large right now, I have, I have them in my yard. Our last house, we had them in the yard. They don't eat anything on my property. I have them in the holly hedge out front. I've never seen them eat a leaf. And even if they did, it's a holly hedge, it's otherwise healthy, I would never even notice. I had them on my tomato plants this past spring. They never ate a leaf. They're just sitting there, they were just hanging out. If you have amaryllis bulbs or crinum lilies, they will gobble them up. They really like them. So they do eat certain plants, but they don't eat every plant. And it's hard to convince people of, they don't eat your lawn, they don't eat your trees, they can be a pest of little citrus trees if you have a lot of them on there and mostly amaryllis bulbs, they will totally defoliate them early in the spring. So there, if you go out there and do your work in early March, you can greatly reduce the number that you have in your yard and kind of keep that going year after year after year. And just a bucket of soapy water, grab the little ones and throw them in a bucket or do what I do, the large ones, just grab them and throw them over the fence in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> I was just going to ask if your neighbors happen to have a bunch of lover grasshoppers. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our next set of plants, hollies, citrus, <clears throat> Nandina, who cares? Uh, <laughs> forum, and the 80 different families of woody plants. Uh, let's see what we're, oh, you're looking you look perplexed. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what it's going to be. Cottony cushion scale. I always say I want to be whoever it is in the entomology world who gets to name these insects. Because cottony cushion scale is more of a description than a name as far as I'm concerned. Look at it. Yep, cottony cushion. You could not name it any better. Um, it's, uh, you know, contains all it needs to reproduce within itself. Um, and the eggs hatch within days or they can hang out and wait if the weather, you know, changes or whatever, um, wait several months. They also uh, are producers of the honeydew. Therefore, they will have um, the sooty mold and the ants. These pictures, what do we see here? Some of our good guys helping us in the fight um, with this cottony cushion scale. So if you see something like this and you may, some people may even think it's a fungus, <laughs> but this is actually a, a live creature. So what do we do about them? This holds true for all the different scales we have here. And I've seen maybe 20 different ones. They, they're nice because they're, they generally are distinctive. And you can tell from the size, the shape, the color, look through you know, the literature and you know, a little reference book and figure out what species it is just from looks. But with any kind of scales, they do, you will find them on your woody plants. I've had them on my hibiscus before, any kind of flowering shrub. 
is going to have scales. The largest scale and in the world of scales, it's very, very large is uh, the magnolia scale. It's on magnolia trees, but it's, it never really damages them. It's, you know, on most magnolias. Uh, Prevention is very important. So keep an eye on your plants. And when you see these little things, it's like a group of bumps on the stem or maybe on the underside of a leaf, probably some kind of scale. You can trim off or pick off small infestations because scales, when they first hatch, it's the only time in their life where they crawl around. And that first instar, teeny tiny little scale, which looks different from how it looks for the rest of its life, it'll crawl and find a good spot on a stem and stay there and molt and shed its skin. And from then on, they stay in that spot for their whole life. They, we have hard scales, which develop a hard shell, soft scales, which don't develop a really hard shell, but they don't move around or crawl after that. They spend their whole life in one spot. So you're never going to see them running around a leaf or running around a stem. They just sit there still but they tend to be in groups. So if you can trim off the group and throw it away, that's fine. There's a lot of parasitoid wasps that feed on all the different species of scales that we have here. So if you look at those scales and all of them have little holes on their back, that means that they were all done away with by parasitoid wasps. And for scales, you wanna use some type of horticultural oil because what the oil does, it covers them, it coats them and it suffocates them. And that's how the oil work. Horticultural oils are very, very safe to use. It's just, it's an oil, you know, so it's not a broad spectrum insecticide. It kills them more physically than chemically. It's not um, uh, a nerve agent or nerve chemical. So use horticultural oil. Don't use horticultural oil during the summer, during the heat of summer, because if you spray a plant that's out in the full sun, with any kind of oil spray, it may get sunburned and the leaves are gonna turn brown and dry up and they're all gonna fall off. So you don't wanna do that. But horticultural oil now from this time of year all the way through winter is a very good control for scales and a lot of other insects. Okay. Now then the next uh, three, we're just, we're going to talk about the different pests and then get to the doctor's orders because they're all gonna be about the same and probably pretty close to what you just heard as well. So here's a wide spectrum of alamanda, avocado, china berry, again, like the Nandina, who cares? Uh, <laughs> citrus, ficus, fringe trees, gardenias, hibiscus, ligustrins, different annuals and vegetables. You can tell, oh, no, I'm sorry. We haven't started the other scales yet. <laughs> um, these are white flies and there are 75 species in Florida. And I can tell you they're not really flies. They're just named that, I guess, because they're white and can fly. And this is the kind of damage that you'll see from you know, um, the underside. This is what the top side will look like. I think it's kind of pretty, but it's probably not all that <laughs> healthy um, for the plant. So well, what do we do? Okay. Vegetables have a lot of, I know, issues with white flies. So what do we do? about those? Yes, a lot of the white flies that we have in Florida are invasive species, but fortunately most of them are more restricted to South Florida, although though some of them do kind of range up almost as far as Hernando County by the end of summer. White flies are very, very closely related to things like aphids and mealybugs. They damage plants in the same way, but white flies are notorious for dragging viral plant diseases around with them. It gets on their mouthpiece and inside their body. So if they feed on an infected tomato plant that has a plant virus, they're gonna pick it up. And then every tomato plant they go to after that, they're gonna give it to that tomato plant. So they're, they spread diseases just like mosquitoes do with people. And that's a huge problem for commercial vegetable growers and even backyard vegetable growers uh, they spread a couple different viruses on tomatoes and a whole bunch of them on cucurbits, which is going to be yellow squash, green squash, watermelons, huge problem with watermelons, watermelons growers. And there's like one or two brand new viruses to Florida that affect watermelons that I've just read about. 
They are kind of the opposite of thrips because when we start off in the spring, the population of white flies is very, very low. And then as we go into summer and through summer, the population goes up and up and up and up and peaks in late summer. And sometimes you'll get outbreaks of naturally occurring fungi that will kill the white flies. And magically your population of white flies will drop like a rock because they all get sick and die from that. If you do have white flies on your plants, especially if you have a vegetable garden, you need to control them because they may contain viruses and they're gonna bring viruses to your plants. And it just takes one white fly to infect your tomato plant. Um, so there are parasitoid wasps that feed on white flies. So they help, they help keep them under control, but a horticultural oil or insecticidal soap is gonna work really well on white flies. But you, it's very important that with them, you catch them very early and you're diligent controlling them, especially with vegetables. They can be a pest of a lot of ornamental plants, but they don't bring viruses to, let's say, your hibiscus or your roses or things like that. They will physically feed on them and damage them so they're bad, but they're not terrible like they are for vegetables. But fortunately, insecticidal soap knocks them right out, but you're going to have to do it more than once and be diligent. Okay. All right. Now we'll move on to the other, the other ones I was speaking of. This one affects uh, camellia, holly, tea, citrus, bottle brush, kumquat, mangoes, and olives. I know we don't grow tea here, but the reason I threw it in there because um, that you know apparently was a problem with tea plants because that's how it got its name. Our tea scale, and they are active all year. The males, once they are mature, they don't even eat. That's the females who are eating. Males have one job and one job only um, after, you know, they mature. So, you know, that would be disappointing, I think, for uh, human males because they do like to eat too, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, there can be a little difficult sometimes because they have a waxy coating that protects them. But those are going to be the, the brown... Um, looking scale that we see. Here's another one that affects peach. Keyword here, peach. Uh, privets, mulberries, china berries, again, invasive tree, go ahead, have them. And up to 121 other host plants. And what could those be? But white peach scale. Now, whether they're named after peach trees because they're on them or because they kind of are white and peach colored, I'm not quite sure, um, but they're not, they'll go anywhere on the plant so they can be on the bark, the fruit, on the leaves. And they have about four generations a year in Florida. And the female lays these orange, the eggs, which will turn orange. Uh, and then they're all female, the first, several uh, you know lay eggs that she lays the first bunches and whole bunches are all going to be female and then later she'll get around to um, the white type eggs which will be the males so you know there's, there's going to be a lot more females because they need obviously that for reproduction so and then the Obviously, you can see we're, we're a little bit on a scale uh, um, trend here. So the next one, going to affect citrus, avocado, crepe myrtle, cedars, elms, hollies, Indian hawthorn, oaks, and even Virginia creeper, which I've never seen any Virginia creeper harmed by them, but this, you know, they have found it on there. And here's our Florida wax scale. Although they only have three generations in a year, these ones happen to be on a stem, but if they get on a leaf, they like to align along the midrib. And all of these scales, all of them, not just these, are also going to have your honeydew, sooty mold, and ant, uh, you know, trifecta going on there. So now that I put all of those together, we'll let the doctor talk about how to control them. You notice that they all look different? Mm -hmm. which that's one group of insects that's a little bit easier for us to identify by just looking at them. You know, many other insects, we have to key them out and look at little body parts, and some are obviously easier than others. 
Scale is pretty easy to identify. Um, many of those different scales have a very wide host range. T scale, you're almost always going to, if you have a camellia, you're going to have T scale because T, the plant that we get, you know, iced tea and hot tea from, is a camellia. We don't normally grow it here in Florida. I'm not sure how, I think that they were looking at that, possibly being able to grow tea commercially in Florida. I'm going to have to look into that, I guess. But yeah, that uh, could be another class for you. Exactly. But the ornamental camellias that we have here, tea scales like them just fine. And many of those different scales, if you have a citrus tree, you're going to find them on there along with snow scale. There's a Caribbean black scale, which is round and pure black, very distinctive. But all of them, the control is the same, horticultural oil. Oils that citrus uh, producers have been using them for 100 years. And horticultural oil is still the number one pesticide the citrus producers use during the year because it works great, works very well on scales and a lot of other insects also. So they spray the trees with oil and it knocks a lot of different things down. And what we usually find about scale is even if you have it under control, they don't disappear. Because remember, as Dr. Lester said, they stay in one place after they're born and are crawlers for a little bit and choose their spot. That's where they're going to be forever. So you have to do this kind of, kind of a gross thing to figure out if you are successful, if you take your thumb and scrape it and it all comes off, then you know you've killed it. If you get some kind of gushy resistance, then you know they're still alive. So, okay, we're just going to go a little bit, a couple more things. We're gonna ask the good doctor because we we're talking about pests and I'm sure a lot of people with lawns hear about chinch bugs. So what about chinch bugs and why haven't we really covered them? Chinch bugs are out there. They're a pest of St. Augustine lawns. And by the end of summer, if anybody with the St. Augustine lawn, if you go out there and look long and hard, and keep in mind, chinch bugs are about the size of a grain of pepper. And you have to get down there on your hands and knees. You have to, well, it's easiest for us to dig up a one square foot sample, look at it in a container on the table, look under the microscope because they are very, very small. Chinch bugs are out there. But I, we do not see them as a major killer of lawns. So even though they're out there, they're damaging lawns, they can be very damaging. We don't see it very often. What we do see a lot more of is fungal um, lawn diseases. They do kill lawns and poor maintenance practices. People either watering too much, fertilizing too much, or the worst thing that you can do for St. Augustine lawn, cutting it too short. That really, really stresses it out and which makes it more attractive to chinch bugs along with diseases. So managing your lawn is the most, correctly, is the most important thing you could do for it. With chinch bugs, if you have a service that sprays your yard, don't worry, they love to spray, spray, spray for chinch bugs, even though I think in the last five years, I've seen maybe one or two samples of chinch bugs at the office. Don't see it very often. 15, 20 years ago, chinch bugs were a major problem. They're not anymore. And we're in the habit of saying, well, if there's a problem with your lawn, it's chinch bugs. And that is probably not the case anymore. Probably that fungal problem that um, Dr. Lester just mentioned, as well as, um, or like I said, those um, cultural practices. So we thought we would just throw that in there. If you're being told you have chinch bugs, um, bring a sample to the extension office and let them look at it for you. Now here's some that bugs that people get really worried about and they are pesky, but they do not qualify as pests. And a pest basically um, to be qualified as a pest, you have to be an economic problem. Uh, or a health problem, or a problem, basically, you know, disastrous to the environment. Even though these are annoying, none of these actually, you know, fit that category. So could you go through them and just talk a little bit about each of these guys here? It's September, sure. so our first one is, you know, a good one to talk about. 
The one in the upper left-hand corner are love bugs, which everybody should be familiar with. Um, love bugs are, in one sense, technically a pest because they are a human annoyance. Immature love bugs live near the surface of soil in damp, grassy areas. That's why love bugs are always worse when you're driving on a highway way out in the country through fields and big grassy areas, you always see a lot more love bugs out there. They help to break down organic matter and dead grass, things like that. So in that sense, they're beneficial because they are recyclers, but love bugs are not a really major pest. Yeah, they're in inconvenience. They can damage the paint on your car and need to wash them off, but they're not that big of a problem. The next one, the pretty red bug here, is an immature Jadera bug. And every spring we get just, uh, people come through the office, they bring them in jars and Tupperware containers, they email us pictures. <clears throat> Jadera bugs feed on the seeds of golden rain trees. So if you have a golden rain tree, which is a nasty invasive tree in your yard, it will flower in the fall and it will drop literally billions of seeds these bugs come along and feed on those seeds. The problem is that their populations will become huge. I've seen pictures and heard complaints about the whole side outside of my garage is covered with these red bugs. What do I do? What do I spray? Nothing. Leave them alone. They'll be gone in about two weeks. They're not a pest. They won't bite you. They won't hurt you. They don't hurt your garage. They don't hurt your plants. They're just looking to feed on those seeds that came off your golden rain tree. If you get rid of the golden rain tree, you will get rid of the Jadera bugs. If you have Jadera bugs, it's because either you have a golden rain tree or your neighbor does. The next one is the Eastern tent caterpillar. It's one of those caterpillars that makes those um, kind of tent-like structures up in the trees. They're not a huge problem. Uh, we do not have gypsy moss down here in Florida, which are a huge problem up north. They're an invasive. The ones down here tend to be, um, Natives, so they will come out, one kind comes out in the spring, another kind comes out either in the spring or in the fall. They'll make their tent, they'll eat some leaves off your tree, damage or defoliate a branch or two, but your tree will grow new leaves. So it's not the kind of thing that you have to control or really do anything about. If you have a huge number of them, like small tree and 20 nests, you know, with a whole bunch of caterpillars in them, you may have, BT would be very, very effective. The problem is how do you spray BT up into a tree safely so you don't hurt yourself? You need to think about that before you go grabbing a ladder and grabbing your backpack sprayer and spraying a tree. You don't need to spray for them. And then bottom left-hand corner here, also every spring we get phone calls about these. They are tussock moths and they feed on your oak tree leaves in the spring. And by the time you notice them, the caterpillars are done feeding because they'll, they'll be up in the oak tree feeding on the leaves and you'll never see them or know they're up there. But then when they're all full size and ready to make a cocoon, they either crawl down the trunk or drop out of the tree. That's when you know, notice them and go into a panic and call us. At that point, in a few days, they're gonna make a cocoon. After that, they're gonna turn into little brown moths. There are lots of insects and wasps out there that feed on them and help keep the populations down. So if, when you notice them, if you just take a deep breath and wait a week or two, they will be completely gone. There is no control that's ever recommended for them, but they can be an annoyance and a nuisance. Okay, thank you very much. So as we're wrapping up, we just want to remind you, 99% of the insects are beneficial, they're our friends, or they're just there, they're not causing any problems, and they're probably a good food source for somebody. Learn the pests from the pals. Today we only learned the pests. We're going to have another class about pals. If you're, when in doubt, um, take a picture, email it to Dr. Lester, that's gonna be your best way. And as he kind of- e Email and pictures, very, very yes. good. That's going to get your quickest answer. Yes. And he kind of touched on killing all of the bugs in your yard. That's going to upset the balance of nature. And the pests are always what regenerates quicker.
Um, so if you determine after going through integrated pest management that a uh, you know a chemical is necessary, and you notice he never gave you a very harmful chemical at all. Everything could be treated with horticultural soap and oil, um, but spot treat just where the issue is. And I'll, most of the time, pruning off that bad area is all you need to do. Throw it away in your kitchen trash. Don't throw it down on the ground, you know, where they're going to regenerate elsewhere. What we didn't touch on is buying healthy plants. <laughs> healthy plants are going to resist pest problems and also right plant, right place. And I kind of gave you those clues all through it. It really seems like native plants do have less, less pest issues than some of the non-native plants. Not saying non-native plants, you know, Florida friendly ones um, that, you know, you can't have them in your yard, but it just really seems like native plants. Um, they also have built in kind of uh, resources that fight off these um, insects. And for, you know, millions of years, there's been the plants and, their, and the insects, and it's all kind of just the balance of nature. So, in fact, when plants don't have insects that keep them in check, that's when we end up with invasive problem plants. So the rule is be tolerant and low levels of pests are going to do minimal damage. So keep scouting and just stay at peace, stay ahead of it. Here's upcoming classes, um, a whole list here. Like I said, you can, you can find this on my Facebook page or on Bill's Facebook page. Um, we have a rain barrel and compost bin workshop tomorrow evening, virtual. The pickup will be the next day here at Hernando County Utilities. If you have any questions or would like to participate in that, how you do that and find out how you pay for the rain barrel and all that, email me. Email me and that's how that process begins. And what I wanted to point out here, since we talked about the pests today, unfortunately, we could only, we had to go way down in the calendar to fit the follow up in our um, schedule. But we're going to do like a follow up on this about beneficial bugs on November 23rd. So put that on your calendar too. We talked about the bad guys. Now we're going to talk about the good guys. And as I mentioned you, in that one slide that had all of those insects. You may see them together, and just because you see insects on your plant or see an insect doesn't mean he was the perpetrator of the crime. So it's good, you know, he may be there actually helping you out. So it's good to learn your friends from your foes. Again, here's our emails. I am Lily B at HernandoCounty.us, and Dr. Lester is W. Lester at UFL.edu. Thank you all for joining us. I know, yep, we went, we usually- I have a question here. Okay, great. And I also put in the chat box, if you go to, we have a freestanding uh, webpage. If you go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, you can see a full listing of all of my classes and Lily's classes and our classes, everything that we're doing on Zoom, Facebook, and everywhere else, and all the information about how to log on to it. It's all right there in one place. And I got a question from Dawn. Is there any research going on for neem seed meal tea soil drenches? That's a long name for a treatment. <laughs> and adding neem seed meal to potting soil mix for potted plants. This is my first year using same and I see great results for several pests except for lovers, of course. No need to answer now as I have to leave the class. Oh, she already left, but we can go. Mm -hmm. I can answer this to everybody else. Um, Lily, I'm going to stay on here for a minute or two when we're done. So don't log off right away so that I can catch yeah. her uh, email address. Everybody loves neem oil. And neem oil can be effective for a number of different insect pests. But it's funny because for some insects, it just deters them. If you spray your plant, the insect pest will lay, land on the plant and go like, oh, neem oil, that, this, it's sticky, it's nasty, it tastes bad, I'm gonna leave. For other insects, it does kill them. For other insects, it really doesn't kill them. And it controls a few plant diseases, but not many. 
And the funny thing with neem oil is it varies from brand to brand about the exact formulation and concentration. So I can buy one brand of neem oil and you can buy a different brand and we're gonna to get totally different results when we go spraying it on a variety of insect pests and diseases in our yards. So there's a lot of um, variability in it. I'm sure that they're always doing research on neem, neem oil and uh, if you take the neem seeds and grind them up and add them to the soil, I would think that that's potentially a very good way to control soil pests. I'm sure they're doing research on it. I'm not familiar with anything recently that they've written up or you know announced that they found. But neem oil, I generally don't recommend it a whole lot. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use it, but it might be a mixed bag. Either you're gonna get really good success with your problem using neem oil to solve it, or it's not gonna work at all. Okay, and I have heard of some citrus drenches being used for fire ant mounds, but it's a um, continual process. You can't do it, it's, like you said, it's not a one and done thing. And usually early, early morning, they say the queen is closer, um, you know, to the top of the mound. And that's a time I've heard of some farmers and other uh, people using the citrus trenches on the ant mounds themselves, but usually they have to do that uh, several times, but it seemed to have some success for them. They're always looking at new controls and they're finding new things. They are definitely heading in the direction of more natural, specific pests, low toxicity to non-target, you know, organism type materials. They are a lot easier to get approved for sale. And it's what the public is kind of demanding. They're not, it's very rare that they develop and release and actually get, you know, labeled and out there, even for commercial growers, the broad spectrum, very, very dangerous kind of things, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we do have someone here who was watching from China. So that, that is fantastic. We welcome um, everyone, you know, to be watching. Um, we are going, you know, Bill and I are charged with uh, staying pretty much what works in Central Florida, <laughs> uh, you know, so um, everyone is, is welcome to watch. We get a lot of South Florida people as well, um, but anyone from all over the world is welcome to watch, but we probably can't answer a lot of questions that aren't directly related to how things grow and work together in Central Florida, but we welcome you as long as you, um, you know, are here to participate with good intentions. Like I said, I did have to remove someone who sent me an odd um, <laughs> chat message. Likely it was only directly to me. And then when I made that statement that I did, a couple other uh, people with um, questionable login names uh, disappeared. So that worked out well. <laughs> there was nothing, nothing untoward occurred. Thank you all for joining us today. Next week, we'll be here again. I think Dr. Lester is going to be joining me again. I think so, yes. Yeah. On the 29th, we're going to be talking about plain pollinators. You know, the beautiful butterflies and the ladybugs and the dragonflies, they get all the attention. We're going to talk about the ones that aren't quite as beautiful and, and the jobs that they do for us. So that'll be next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Thank you, everyone. And I will... Stop the recording and see you all next week.